thing. I mean, it could be up to all of the area chairs, but I don't think we're going to have that many. I am recording it, so um, any of the area chairs that can't participate can view it afterward. Yeah, that's awesome. What we, what we said was that um, uh, at least one person from each area to be on, um, and for those who um, couldn't, that each area or whoever the represent, representative would, would communicate with the rest of their area. Um, but I think that's also great that we're recording it too, so that we can make that available to the rest of the area chair. So we can get started whenever, uh, Rick, you're ready to um, give us an overview of all academic, and then we can have some time toward the end for questions. That would be great. Yeah, with so many people on the call, that would be good to wait until the end. Yes, we could do that. Yeah. So while you're presenting, why don't we um, plan on everyone just having your uh, phone on mute? And then also, there's that chat function that you can, and if there are questions that come up while Rick is presenting, if folks want to type their questions in, and then we can go back. So you should see a chat function at the bottom. Um, that you can um, type questions into. Is that, is that okay for everybody? Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay. gonna mute now, and Rick, I'll let you take over. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I may ask you to unmute a time or two, just because Yes. I, I know our software, but I don't always know your process, so on occasion it may be useful. Yes. <laughs> Have some snacks. This is one to five. All right, it sounds quiet. I think everybody is muted. So I am logged in to your site and I'm logged in as the demonstration user. I've set up the demonstration user to be an area chair for area one. What we call an area chair, or what you, we call it, use a different word than you do, we call all of you a unit planner. So you'll notice that on the page, you'll see words like unit planner. That to us means the same thing as area chair. So just when you see that language, you'll know what that means. I'm seeing uh, chats popping up. What do we have here? Okay. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do today, I've already submitted about three fake submissions that we're going to track I'm getting feedback from somebody's system. Someone should probably mute so I don't continue to get that. There, thank you. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so I've already submitted three fake submissions that we're going to track through the process. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to go through an actual submission. That's happening as we speak, uh, theoretically. That will continue to happen until your deadline. And then at that point, that's when you will jump in and start doing your work to uh, assign the proposals to reviewers. So I'm going to talk about that part. So we're going to start, we're going to jump in as if the deadline has just passed and it's time for you to begin doing your work. And I suspect some of this work you can do even before, but we'll, uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. So you'll notice that the page is set up with a couple of different menus. The submitter menu, most people who log into the site will only see a submitter menu. All of you will, you either now or will soon see a unit planner menu. So that's, that's the area chair menu. There are only three links here. Uh, the first one is the most important. I'll talk about the other two briefly, just so you have a sense of what these are for. The first one, view submission statistics, the first of the ones that is, are perhaps least important. This will show you just a quick overview of how many submissions have come in to each area for each category of submission. So this just gives you a sense of what's going on in the site. It doesn't really have any other purpose. The third link is request reports, and this is where you can go request data out of the system in a Microsoft Excel format. There are only a few reports that you will have access to. The statistic, well, I guess the key ones are Really, the statistical reports by subunit will be the most important because that will have, that's where you can get your review data. So after your reviewers have finished the review process, you could pull the data in a report and view it. You would just select one of them 
and just keep clicking on the items at the bottom of the li list until it gives you the option to request the report which I'm not going to do because there is no data in here at the moment, so that's not particularly useful. But this might be, this will become useful later. So keep in mind that you do have a way to request reports. And if there are other reports that are needed, we can be in, in contact with the staff at LRA, and if we need to make a few more available, we can always do that. There are many reports that are possible in this system. I think there are only a few, though, that you have access to uh, and most of the reports we have would not be relevant to you anyway. Uh, so those are the, the last two links. Those are really, we're not spending our time on these today. We're going to spend all of our time under the first link, which is submission management. So if you just remember, log in under the unit planner menu, the first link, that is where almost all of your work will be done. And that's what I'm going to click on now. And by doing that, I landed in area one. I mentioned up up top that this demonstration user, I set this person up to be the unit planner or area chair for area one. So clicking on the submission management link took me directly into area one. So for all of you, you will be assigned to a specific area. Clicking on that link will take you directly into your area. So this is where all of the work gets done, the submission management area. Uh, the top window just tells you where you are. The next window is the task menu. And you'll see that there are so there's a link on the left under setup to activate volunteers as reviewers. And on the right, there are some other links. These are the links that you're going to use after you've assigned your reviewers. And then the bottom part of the page gives you some statistics and gives you data at the very bottom. So all of your actual review assignment takes place from this page. This is where you'll go through the submissions or through the reviewers and assign people to submissions. Before that can happen though, we have to go through the process of, of activating uh, your reviewers. So if you're taking notes and you want to remember the steps that you're going to go through, step number one is to activate volunteers as reviewers. And what that means is currently there, well, through the, through the last month or however long your system's been open up until your deadline, people have the option to log into the system and volunteer to be a reviewer, or to be a chair, or they have other options to volunteer as well, but many people will volunteer as reviewers. The fact that they have volunteered to be a reviewer does not instantly make them a reviewer. You will go through a process of screening through these people, making sure the people who have volunteered are actually uh, qualified to be reviewers, because anybody could volunteer. That does not mean that you want to use them as a reviewer. So that's what this step is for. You would click activate volunteers as reviewers. And what that will do is it will just reload the data window at the bottom of your screen to the volunteers tab. And it will show you all of the people who have volunteered. Now, here's another important part of this step. Initially, all this is going to show all of your volunteers, whether they volunteer to be a chair or a discussant or a reviewer. So you don't wanna make everybody into a reviewer. So in order to filter this so you're only seeing the reviewers, you have to determine which role they volunteered for. So you use this very first widget and select reviewer and then search. And then you'll notice there are 105 records now. <clears throat> when I click search, there are now 93. So there were 12 people who volunteered who did not volunteer to be a reviewer. That's an important step. You need to make sure you're only looking at the people who volunteered to be a reviewer. Then, once you have your list of reviewers, you will simply go through them and figure out which ones are, uh, would be appropriate reviewers for your area. Now, just to be clear, when people volunteer to be reviewers, they are volunteering for specific areas. So this list I'm seeing, this, these are only people who volunteered to be reviewers for area one. So you can safely add any of them if you feel that they are qualified to be a reviewer. And you'll notice that not everyone has the same uh, level of experience. So you know, this first person, it tells us the area of experience and a little other information. The position says other, so you, you'll, you might have to figure that out, but maybe you'll know. Uh, this is just what we, the information we have. This person's an assistant professor. This person is a graduate or doctoral student. So, you know, there's... 
Can yes. I chime in there? Because you're bringing up an important point. Um, yeah, so, I mean, people can only um, um, volunteer to be a reviewer for up to four areas, but then within your area, you want to make sure that um, you limit the number of, um, you know, I would say no more than three if you, you have a person that you're going to. But you also want to really pay attention to um, their membership information or their current position, whether or not it's a doctoral student. So if you have a doctoral student on, you definitely want to um, only have one doctoral student review per submission. And we don't have a policy yet, but I mean, for me, honestly, I would prefer to see three, uh, you know, uh, people who are beyond their doctoral program, so assistant professor or above, to be reviewers, um, but I understand that a number of our members and people who volunteer are doctoral students. So we're at an interesting point here in terms of being able to balance that and have enough people to actually do the reviews. But you want to have a majority um, professors versus, um, so the experience is, is important. All right. And so uh, another note is that you'll notice there's a little table over here on the right. It says reviewer and it tells us uh, this is how many submissions the person's been assigned in the current area as opposed to the all areas. So the A is for assigned. If you mouse over it, you'll see assigned pop up. The V is volunteered. So this person volunteered for this area, but for a total of four areas. So this person volunteered for only two areas. So if you go down the list, you'll see, well, here's someone somehow volunteered for five. This may have been before we set a limit in the software. Uh, there may be a few of those, but we have some threes. But that's something to keep in mind when you're looking through these. If someone volunteered for a bunch of different areas, uh, that may be a less useful reviewer to you than someone who didn't volunteer for as many. Uh, just keep in mind that when you're assigning your submissions, you're going to be paying attention to how many submissions that person's been assigned. If someone's been assigned 50 submissions, don't assign anymore. And I don't know if you have a guideline for how many you assign to any given person, but ju just use a reason here. Yeah, and know uh, that Rick, we, we do. I mean, I, I think no more than, you know, between 10 and 15 for a person. Uh, Total for the person. Quality reviews per person, top. You know, so, so that's across all of the different areas. Areas that they, yeah, yes. So if they're assigned for four, you might get you might get to assign them two or three. Right, right. Okay. So keep that in mind as you're going through and activating these people, because you do want to make sure you have people that uh, will be able to do the reviews. Uh, it also it's it's kind of can work as a first come first serve. You know, if you get some assignments done early. Uh, you know, you need to pay attention to how many they've been assigned. Uh, you know, get them, get them assigned early before they're already used up. It's just a, a tip. You know, don't wait till the last second. Because if you do, uh, you may discover that the reviewers are already assigned as much as they should be. And you need to go out and find more reviewers. And you don't want to be in that position. Mm -hmm. So you really want to get this done as soon as you're allowed to get in. Uh, so those are uh, just notes here. If you wanted to, let's say you were going to assign, excuse me, not assign, but you're going to activate nearly every reviewer. You'll notice there are check boxes next to the names. If you check the very top box up at the very top, it selects everybody. And then you could go through and then deselect anyone that you don't want to have review. So you might just select, you know, you might choose not to have the graduate students. And then when you get to the bottom of the screen, you would check, check, check the item, add reviewer, and update. And that would then activate all of the people that you selected. Now, I'm not going to do that because uh, I, it, I'm not the person who should be activating your reviewers. But, and this is really is real data. But what I am going to do for our purposes today is I'm going to just activate one person who I will deactivate when we're done. So I'm just going to choose the first person on the list so I can find that person instead of doing them in bulk. I'm just going to add this person as a reviewer. So I, I did it, and now that person is marked as a reviewer, and this is now grayed out. And then I could walk through and I could do it with more if I wanted. So the point here is, these are volunteers. You need to make them into reviewers before you can assign them to anything. 
And once I, you've activated them, under the reviewers tab, you'll see everybody who was activated. So the reviewers tab shows your, you your pool of available reviewers. Those are the people you'll be able to assign to submissions. So first step, activate reviewers. Did I hear something there? Okay. So once you have gone through that process, then the next step is to actually assign the submissions to the reviewers. And there are two ways you can do this. You can either su assign the submissions submission by submission, and that has the benefit of looking through the reviewers, finding the right one, and making sure you assign exactly three so that it is a, a, a reasonable way to do this. So we could go to this AA test paper, and then on the right, click Assign Reviewers, and then I would get information about the submission. I could download to read the article, the, what they uploaded, and then at the bottom of the screen, I have a list of all the review, reviewers available. You should normally have a long list here, but we only have one because I just activated one person. And if I want to assign this person to review, I would just click Assign Reviewer next to that person. Or if I wanted to find three people, I would go through, check three boxes, use the Assign as Reviewer, and click Update. And that's how I would assign that person. Make sense? I hope. You can assign submission by submission. I'm not going to do that. Uh, that is one way. Uh, that may or may not be your most efficient way to assign your reviewers. It depends on your numbers. If you have far more submissions than you have reviewers, then it may make more sense to assign reviewer by reviewer. Uh, and you can do that by, instead of going to the tab where you find the submissions, which is the individual presentations tab, which includes your papers, posters, et cetera, or you can go to the sessions, and then we find things like the alternative format session and some of the full sessions that are submitted, that are reviewed as a full session. And those are reviewed in exactly the same way. You can either go through those tabs, or you can go to the reviewers tab, find a reviewer, and then click assign reviewer. And then we can assign um, Helen Anderson Clark to some submissions. So I have brought her into scope, it shows her information at the top, and at the bottom of the screen, I see a list of my submissions, and I can choose which ones I would like to assign her to. Now, a couple notes about this page, which is also true of the other page that we were looking at a moment ago. You will notice that uh, Helen Anderson Clark, she provided some areas of expertise, cl critical literacy, disciplinary uh, literacy, content literacies, et cetera. These are, give you kind of a clue as to how you might want to assign someone. Now, in an ideal world, you would be collecting the same kind of data for your submissions, which you, you don't do, but uh, you, you should be able to tell, probably by looking at the titles in many cases, whether the areas here align with what the topic area of the submission may be. <laughs> so you might use that to help you make a decision. Uh, or you may be made to assign in a more random manner. But let's say I wanted to assign Helen to these first three papers. I would just check the boxes. Let's say they're the ones that fit the best. I'll go to the bottom of my screen. I'm going to click Assign as Reviewer, and this time I am going to click the button. <coughs> she's now assigned, it tells me, in the current content area, she's assigned to three. Across all content areas, she's assigned to three. Uh, so we're gonna stop there. She's now been assigned. Notice that on this page, we're looking at individual submissions. We could also go through the sessions, and I could assign her to something here as well. Everyone has their own idea of how they want to divide up the reviewers. Some, there are some of our associations will take certain types of submissions and give those to specific reviewers so that they're comparing like things when they're reviewing. And, they can and then that way, the relative scores of the different uh, submissions are, uh, are a good comparison. So some people will choose that as their method of assigning. Some will do it based on topic area because that is the best way to assure that someone can review something that is, uh, that is in their area of expertise. So uh, it's certainly, I, I don't know exactly what, if you have any rules for this, but it's, uh, you know, you, you need to assign these in a way that makes the most sense so that you get the best results back 
from your reviewers. And I think that is primarily up to you, how you choose to do it. So that is how we assign reviewers. Um, Rick, yes. I probably, I know we've, we've talked about this because um, I'm reading some of the questions in the chat. Um, recall we talked about the fact that our proposals have to be um, blinded and um, also there's the word count. And so people with their submissions are submitting uh, PDF. Uh -huh. um, can you go over with, with everyone how they will be able to go into, um, before they assign out their, their um, reviewers, they need to go through and make sure that all of the proposals are in fact blinded. And that's for paper sessions, that they are blinded. Um, okay. And also the, the uh, word count is, is kind of on the honor system because we don't have a, um, a, a set way within all academic to check word count. Um, so they have to say that this is their word count. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's look at just, um, we'll look at this one here, this first real submission. So if we wanted to check to see if it is blinded or to check the word count, what we would do is we'd click on the title. And then at the bottom of the screen, this is the proposal. Now you can quickly look, I mean, it's pretty unlikely since we only collect the title. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to see anything here that's going to identify the author's name. These are the authors. This is, th this is something they, that they just type in so we know who they are, but this is not ever displayed to the um, reviewer. So don't worry if under author you see authors, you should. This is the proposal. This is the document they uploaded. So what you would do is you would click on it. So I'm gonna click on that and it's going to ask if I wanna open it or save it. I'm just going to open it. I could save it to my desktop and read it, but since I'm not going to actually do anything, it's not necessary. So I'm going to open this. Now, this is the document. You can look through and make sure their name isn't listed. So the first issue is make sure it's just, they don't identify themselves in the text of the document. And then you can see, get a pretty good idea of how long this is. This looks like it's probably a reasonable proposal. This is not one that is you know, full paper. It's, this is more what you are asking for. Uh, but then the other thing you should do, and I'm using preview in on a Mac, but there should be somewhere in here, let's see, in the file. Yeah, if you, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more work, but if you take either the PDF, yeah, take the PDF, you can go in and do a search and look for the names, but it's for each area chair, each group, so you'll want to decide on a plan for this that you should be reviewing, and I'll be reviewing um, the papers as well, but you should be reviewing your papers before you send them out. And if you find within this first you know, week or so before you begin to assign reviewers that let's say someone didn't blind um, their proposal, you can send it back to them and, and ask them to do that. Um, and re resubmit it. See, this is the one I just did. Oh, keeps wanting to hide from me. I want to. I think if I open there, yeah, here it is. So if I if I save it to my desktop or somewhere, I could then right click on it, and I believe there's a place. I'm trying to remember where you find the properties. Maybe it's Get Info. And this one looks fine. Name and extension with I'm looking to see if there's anything in here that shows the in the properties see another thing that people don't do frequently is they'll upload a document and in the properties of the document I'm not, I'm not using Adobe Acrobat Reader which is would make this easier because there you can just go to the file and properties and you can see and it may show the author's name now the reason that that's important is that some people on some devices especially if they choose to do their reviews on an iPad uh, the display for the documents can be a little bit different. It actually might just show you if there are properties saved with the person's name, it will just show the name right there in the listing for the, the file. I don't have that problem here in my browser, but um, that is something that also that you might check. But 
at a minimum, check to make sure that, they're, uh, that they didn't put their name in the actual document. And then if you can check the properties, that's even better. Rick, so if in the, in the you know, coming days, as we start to get submissions and the reviewers begin of oh, somebody else's commenting, um, yeah. So I just want to verify that if, a, if we contact them and say, hey, we noticed that you forgot to blind your submission, or it's, there may be a number of things that come up. What's the process? Can you verify for us in terms of having the authors resubmit their proposal into the all academic system? Uh, no, you don't have to do that. You, what you would do is, uh, let's see if I go back in here again. Uh, if you can download it, and it's a, uh, it, see, if there, this is the final version, and you'll yeah. notice there's no other version displayed here. This means the PDF was uploaded. If someone uploads a Word document and it was converted to a PDF, you will have access to see the Word document also. So another option is for you to click on the Word document, edit it, and then click Upload to upload it again. It will become the active document. It will get converted as a PDF. So you could theoretically strip the data out yourself if if necessary. If you, well, if we'd be so kind. That may be a humane thing to do, but that's also a lot of work for people to do. Um, when people I, no, I, I agree with that, but it also may be less work than having to contact each person. Yeah, that's true. So, so, it, so just, go ahead, go ahead. So that, that is an option. The other option is you can have them send it back to you. Uh, now there are, I don't know how you want to work this this year, but generally we shut down their ability to edit their, their submission up until the, uh, right, right when the deadline hits. So as right. soon as the deadline hits, they can't do anything with they it. They can't do anything. They right. can't upload it again. Now we could put up a link for them to not be able to edit anything they've typed, but to allow them to upload the proposal again and leave that open. And, well, let it, it and then like you can contact them, they can come back and they can upload a revision if you prefer to do it that way. But the other option is, so there's a couple of options here. The one option is if there is a Word document also, because they converted it to PDF, if we wanted to edit if there needed to be, and, and everyone keep in mind, this isn't going to be a lot. I mean, there may be a few that you notice. But if we wanted to go in and make the changes ourselves in the Word document, the area chairs can re-upload that, that, up, that edited Word document. Or you can email the authors and ask them to send you via email an edited, blinded copy, and then we still upload that into the system. The area chairs can do that. Is that correct? That is correct. And then right. you'll notice the emails are here. So you can use this when you go in, to, when you click on the title of the submission, it will show you the uh, email addresses of the authors. So right. you have the information you need to do that. And then I suspect another option is that you could simply reject the proposal if it's-, if it's Yes, you could. That, that is the other option. So those are your options, but you should ch at least check them out. Okay. So that is how you would go through that process. So we've now talked about kind of the pre-preparation. You have to activate your reviewers. You should go through your submissions, make sure that, and we didn't do this in order, but you should make sure that they actually blinded their submissions. And then you should assign them all to reviewers. And just make sure that you've assigned three to each. Now, one thing that you can use, if you do assign reviewer by reviewer, it can become slightly more difficult to, to determine that you've assigned three to each submission. So what you would want to do is, uh, if you do it reviewer by reviewer, I would suggest if you have graduate students, assign them last and make sure everything's been assigned to at least two to all submissions and then assign those grad students last. And that way you only have one grad student per, which would be a, you know, a perfect way to, to do this. Uh, if you want to make sure that you have the minimum number for each, at the top of the search interface, you'll notice this says these are individual presentations sorted by title in ascending order. If we click on title, we can change this and instead do it by the number of reviewer assignments in ascending order 
and save it. And then that way, the ones that have the fewest number of reviewers will appear at the top. The ones with the most will appear at the bottom. And that way, if you go through it that way, you'll know that once the top one has three reviewers, you will have assigned three to each. So that's just a way to keep track of uh, how many you've assigned if you're not assigning submission by submission. And that should uh, come out, turn out to be helpful. Now, I want to point out that right above the data where we just talked about assigning uh, reviews, there is a little statistics window that lets you track your work. So we can see now that there are 28 unassigned individual submissions and three are pending. These are the three that we just assigned, assigned to our reviewer. So your job, you know you're done with this first step when you have all the numbers in pending and nothing is unassigned. Once you've done that, you're ready to move on to the next step. And the next step would be probably to let your reviewers know that they should start doing their reviews. And the way you would do that is to send a bulk email. So you'll notice that on the right hand side, the very first link here is send bulk email, which I'm going to click. And you are going to send a uh, reviewer notification letter. And I have the 2017 letter in here, it looks like. Let's just see if that's true. This is a letter, yep, so we'll probably, we'll need to update this one soon. Uh, but this is the letter that you would send to the reviewers, letting them know that they should begin their work of doing their reviews. And so it tells here, it says, thank you for agreeing to review, uh, gives them the link to log in, uh, and all of you know, the information that the person will need. And you wanna send this, it's going to automatically select reviewers, you wanna send this to all of the assigned reviewers. So you are notifying every reviewer you've assigned that they should get started. I'm gonna click apply changes. Now you'll remember, we've only assigned one person, so I only see one name here. If we had assigned 50 reviewers, we'd have a list of 50 people. We could click the box at the top to select all of them, and then click preview, and we would get a preview of the letters that we are going to send. So here's the one to Helen Anderson Clark, uh, but it already puts in her name, it does all of the work for us, and all we have to do is click send. Uh, but if we had 50 reviewers, it would send 50 letters one to each person with their name, letting them know what they should do and with the instructions. So that's how the bulk email works. It's a good way to uh, notify a bunch of people about something. And we use this process, the bulk email process, for sending um, notifications to reviewers, but also to send acceptance and rejection notifications to the submitters. So this will get used again later in the process. Um, you Rick, use it. Just a quick, this is just a side <laughs> as I was reading the bulk. We need to go in, Caitlin, I'm, I just want to make sure that it's on our radar. We need to edit all those bulk emails still, how it looks like. I yeah, thought we you, updated them for 2018, but we need to update them, is that correct? Yeah, I can show you, I can talk to you about okay. where you do All right, that. I think we talked about it, but I just want to make sure. All right, mm -hmm. go ahead, sorry. All right, so this, that's it. I, I want to also mention that you'll remember when we did this, we chose to send this to all the assigned reviewers. If we later on in the process, when most of your reviewers finish, but a few of them have not, you can send reminders to just the ones who are pending or those who have saved their work to finish later, and then send it to only those people. So that you can send reminders to only the people who have not finished and not the ones who have. That makes sense. So this is also a great tool for you to send reminders to your reviewers uh, a little later on in the process after most of them have finished their work and you need to nudge those last several to get their work done so that you can go on to the next step. So that is one of the tools that you will use during this stage when everything has been assigned. You can also use the, uh, the, the data window at the bottom and looking at the submissions and you can tell how many reviewers have finished. This says zero of one have finished, so it's still pending. If we had three assigned and two had finished, it would say two of three. Uh, and so you can tell submission by submission how many have finished. You can also tell per reviewer by going to the reviewers tab. We can see that this person has three pending reviews. So what presumably will happen at this time is the reviewer will log in and do a review. And I just want to show you what the reviewer sees. I kind of have a back door here to do that. I'm going to click on reviewer menu. when. Um, Helen M. Anderson Clark logs in. She will see, this is her area one, these are her area one reviews, 
It tells her she has three pending and three across all content areas. Shows there are three, and then here they are. All she has to do is click review and fill out the form. And of course, they can download the proposal either on that previous page or on this one. And they would just go through and give this some scores. And I'm doing this now because I want you to see it works. And we'll put comments to the author. Um, and then we're going to accept it. So that, the reviewer is pretty easy. They just go through and review. Obviously, the reading is the hard part, but the form itself is pretty straightforward. There's not much to do here. I want to do two of these real quickly, just so we have some data that uh, you can see as you get on to the next step. Because after the reviewers finish their work, your job is to decide um, of these things that were reviewed, uh, what you're going to accept and what you're going to reject. So after the reviewers finish, you can see now this person has two complete and one pending. I did, went and did it for this person because I'm pretty sure I could sit here all day and it would never get done if we sat here and waited. And then complete, we have two complete submissions, one of one and zero pending. So at this stage, uh, when you're just about done, you may have some instances where you have three assigned reviewers and only two finish. And in some of those cases, you'll need to go in and do some reassignment of reviewers because on occasion, something will happen where a reviewer might uh, you know, be very ill or uh, have something happens in the family or things happen. And uh, so on occasion, you do have to remove a reviewer. So this is looking at this for this test paper three. We see that Helen M. Anderson Clark is pending. If I had three reviewers, they would all be listed here. And I'd be able to see which ones were pending and which ones were complete. And I could then unassign the pending reviewer and then go down and find somebody else. Uh, if you know, if you want to be nice, another thing that you can do is you can mark the reviewer delinquent, uh, which is very similar to unassigning the person, except it, you don't lose uh, you don't lose track of the fact that that person was once assigned. <laughs> Essentially, when you mark them delinquent, it tells the software that it no longer needs that reviewer in order to move forward. So you could mark one delinquent. That way, you can keep track of people who did not finish their reviews, for whatever reason, whether there is a good reason or not. And then you know not to assign that person again because you know that they were delinquent and there was maybe a reason for that. And it's just a way to keep track. It's better than just removing them and then not remembering and then assigning them to a last minute review. So just keep in mind, you have the ability to remove people by unassigning them, marking them delinquent, and then adding a different reviewer and then contacting someone who you really trust to do those last second reviews so you can get them all done. But sometimes you do have to refactor the reviews. All right, so after they are all finished, the reviewers are finished, you will see zero in the unassigned column, zeros in the pending column, and then you'll see all of your numbers incomplete. Once you reach that stage, you're ready for the next step. And that is the step where you go through the reviews and decide which submissions you're going to ultimately accept for the program and which ones you are not. And the way you will do that is up at the top of the screen, once again in this task menu, on the right, you'll see something called Completed Reviews Report, Accept or Reject Proposals. I'm going to click there. And this screen will allow me to select either the individual submissions or the sessions. There's a bunch of other stuff we can choose to show, but I'm going to ignore this table and come back to it later. I'm just going to choose individual submissions and then load the records. And it's going to load all of my review data for the papers that have been reviewed so far. You'll notice that we can see the title of the paper. If I click on that, by the way, it'll give me a summary and a link to download if I want to read through it myself. I, you can see the pop-up review summary, which will pop open another tab, which will allow us to see the comments which you know, hopefully they're more useful than what I just put there. And uh, then on the right, you have a table. And these are the different review criteria. They're here in here as codes because the, the text itself is too long. But if you click on one of them, it'll give you a pop-up window and show you what they mean. And so you have a little key there. And then they're always in the same order. And you can see the scores. 
And you'll notice there's a column here, this R, that's the reviewer's code. If I had three reviewers, there would be three columns just like this. And then an average score for each criterion and an overall average score. So this page is going to be displayed in um, descending order with highest average score at the top, lowest average score at the bottom. So presumably best to worst paper. So this allows you to go through this page and what most people will do is they'll go through and accept the very best, reject the, wor the ones at the very bottom, and then they'll spend a lot of time going over the ones that are on the margins. And that's, I suspect, what most of you will do. Because if, you, if somebody gets all fives, it's kind of, you probably aren't going to reject it. Uh, most likely that's going to be accepted. But that's, a, that's all you'll do on this page. You'll go through, look at the data, decide what you're going to accept and what you're going to reject. These can, I add, are, can I add to just a timeline? Yes. I'm sure some folks may be thinking about this. We have our planning meeting in June, June 7th through the 9th, where um, individuals will come from each area. Our thought is that the final decisions will not be made until we actually meet to talk about overall program issues. So we'll be doing the, making these decisions together at that meeting. Okay. Uh, another note is if you have a lot of papers or a lot of submissions, you also can do this in bulk. So you could go through and figure out where your cut score is. And let's say you wanted everything that has a, you want to accept everything that has an average raw score that is greater than or equal to four. And then click set. It will set all of them to accept, click update, and it will update everything. And then you could do, find a cut line for reject. Everything that is below a certain score, you might reject. You could do it in the same manner. And that will, allow, and then you just click update and it will just save the data to the database. So I just clicked accept. These are now both marked as accepted. The top part of the screen, the only thing I'll say about this is most of our clients do not use this, but we have a few who rely on it. This is uh, if you wanna do some statistical analysis on the reviews. So you can calculate Z scores, transformed raw scores, normalized scores, the sums of those, the averages of those, and you can then load the records and see all of the data. And you can, it'll give you some information that may or may not be useful to you. Uh, but this will allow you to uh, figure out the variance from the mean. So the, really the purpose of this is you don't want someone to be punished because they had a reviewer that happened to be grumpy and gave everybody low scores. Uh, you want to try to put it more on a bell curve. And that's what this, those kinds of things will allow you to do. If you understand how to use this, do it. If you don't, ignore it. And that's really all I have to say about that. All right. So now when I go back here, you'll notice these say they're accepted. And it says accepted. So at your meeting, I suspect you're going to make these final decisions. Uh, Caitlin, is it also true that at that meeting, that's when all of the papers will be grouped together into sessions? That's correct. Okay. So that's, uh, so what you would do after you finish when everything now is either accepted or rejected, then your last, your last project as an area chair is to, is to uh, uh, you don't have anything to do with any sessions you review because what, if you accept them, they're ready to be scheduled. If you reject them, then they're not going to be scheduled. The individual presentations will have to be grouped together. So the individual papers presumably are placed into a paper session, the individual posters into a poster session and whatnot. And the way you do that is you create sessions and group them into those sessions. Over here on the right again, we're now on the third link. You notice how we kind of go through these in order. We create a session. And I'm going to create a paper session. So you can see these are the three types of sessions you can create. We'll create a paper session. We're going to call this paper session one. I don't need to type anything else in here. Uh, I, I should mention that this form that you use to create these sessions and into which you're going to group papers, a paper session uh, goes, uses the exact same form that the, uh, the administrators of the site will use to create plenary sessions, keynote addresses, meetings, receptions. And on, occasions, on occasion, they put in a description for those particular sessions. When you're putting a paper session together, you do not need to fill out any of these fields that are uh, optional. The only field you really need to fill out is 
the title of the, the session. And I'm putting in a kind of a working title because I have no idea what I want to call this until I pick the papers. So I will put in something temporarily. Then I'm going to go to the next page and look at my papers and um, pick some that go together. And then I'll go back and I'll change the title after. So you'll notice this next page is where we actually build out the session. And you'll see there are five steps listed here. Much like the previous page, not all of the steps are going to be relevant for every type of session. So for your session, for a paper session that you're going to group together, you'll need to put in a title. Then you'll need to add your accept, accepted papers to the session. And that is what step one is about. Add an accepted reviewed paper to your session. By the way, I'm logged in as demonstration user and I'm listed as the session organizer. If you are logged in, your name will be at the top and you will be listed as the session organizer for every session you create. That does not show in the program. That is just something that's there so that, you, that any administrator that needs to go back and ask a question about a session that was created knows who created it and can go back and ask that person if needed. So don't worry about your name appearing there. So that's just a little aside. But the first step is we're going to add an accepted reviewed paper to our session. So we're gonna click view accepted papers. I'll get a list of all the papers I've accepted. I'll check, I'll select some that go together and I'm just going to click add, I'm gonna add them. And I've added those papers to my session. So you're just gonna pick some that go together, add them to your session, put them in the order you like. So if I wanted test paper two to be presented before test paper one, I could move it up. And then after I've added my papers, I then move on to the next step. Step number two is in add invited papers. This is not a step that you're going to use for this part of the process. This is more for uh, when an administrator is creating a plenary session and they have a couple of people who are going to uh, present their work who they invited to the, the to the conference who do not need to go through a review process. They can just add in their titles and then just add them directly to the session. Not really relevant to this kind of a session, so we skip that. The next step is add volunteer participants. This is where you can look at a list of people who volunteered to be chairs or volunteered to be discussants for your particular area and find one who fits this particular session. So if I click view volunteer chairs, I get a list of all the people who volunteered to be a chair for area one. And I can find someone who I think fits. So if I wanted to choose this first person, what I would want to look at first is whether this person has already been selected as a chair. And we can see so far this person is listed as a presenter on something that has not yet been accepted or rejected. So I don't really care about this yet. Uh, when you get later, get to the later on in the process, all of your acceptances and rejections are likely done by the time you're doing this. So you'll be able to tell if somebody else has listed the person as a chair or if you have already used the person as a chair. Because once you use somebody up, you don't want to continually assign the same person as a chair over and over. So pay attention to the counts over here. And if you see chair and they're already in an accepted chair role, go on to somebody else. But if you find someone you like, just click add chair and it adds them to your list. Once you've built out the session and it looks like a complete session, you would go to the last stage and click accept and continue. By the way, if you don't get very many volunteers, you may have to try to find someone to be a chair. And you can search for someone in the database by last name to add them. Uh, and uh, you know, if you happen to know someone who'd be a great fit who you know is going and is willing, you have this other option in step four, which hopefully you don't have to use that. You can just use your volunteers and that makes it easy. They're already a volunteer to do this. Then you click accept and continue. Now here's the most important part about putting sessions together. When you land on the summary page, your, for, your session has not been saved yet. We are just gathering up data. Nothing gets saved until you click the final accept and continue button on this summary page. That's what will save your work. Now, I'm gonna tell you why we do that and why we don't save the work as you go, and hopefully this will help you remember to click this final button. When we first started this software, we, um, we used to save on every click for everything everyone submitted. There were two problems with that. 
One problem is we ended with a lot of incomplete data and that was a mess and it was much harder for people to deal with. Second problem is that when you do save to the database, if you're trying to keep all of your data accurate, you have to lock the tables as you write into the database. And, that's, and if you do that and you have a bunch of people submitting at once, it can really back up and slow down the process. Well, as most of you probably know, most people submit their proposals at the last minute. And I, I'm sure this is not big news to any of you. And it's true across every academic discipline, people submit late, especially if they have to write anything. They will spend every moment trying to make it perfect up until the last second, and then and only then will they submit. Well, because of that phenomenon, we have, you know, we have clients that submit 15,000 submissions. And when we get to a deadline, if we allow all of them, if we had them save on every click and the tables get locked, what was happening is it would, lo it would lock up the system. We couldn't get everyone through. And we discovered that by waiting until the last click to do the save, we could get thousands more people through the system at any given second, which made the software just far more robust, which is why we make you save everything up and click the final accept and continue button on the, su on the summary page to save your work. You'll know that you're finished when you land, you've hit the, that button and you land back on the submission management page. And then if we need to go back and edit that session, it's going to be listed under the sessions tab. Here it is, paper session one. I could just click edit, go back and edit it. I could go change that title to something that makes more sense. And then this is the other little tip. When you go back to edit something, you have to click all the way through and then click that final button again to save your work. So if you remember that, you will have far fewer problems in working with creating sessions. And then once you have, all, once all of your individual presentations are either accepted and in session or rejected, then you know you're done. If you have any that are just marked as accepted, you can click the button here, we don't have any of those, we still need to put those into sessions. They need to be grouped together. All of them need to be accepted and in session. And once you've done that, you are done with your work uh, in the software. Any questions? You, you, you can go ahead and unmute now, I think. <laughs> I, I was, I've been reading, Rick, the, um, the chat and yeah, I can't do that while I'm doing no, I'm, I know. I'm in my way. So there, there have been a few questions throughout, but you've addressed, um, or we've addressed many of them. There was just a question um, about a practice. Like if, if folks are able, I know you have three test papers in, but those won't be available. I mean, folks can say if they feel like they need to be able to practice um, in each area, is that something that would be useful to people or do you feel like it's, well, I, I mean, we could put in test papers. I don't, I, I don't know if I recommend that. Yeah, I would say I don't know that we've done that in the past. Yes, they can test. Um, yeah. There are a couple of stages at which they could test. One is you could create yourself as a reviewer. We talked about activating volunteers as reviewers, but we can also act, just go directly to the people tab and search for someone and add them as a reviewer. So what you can do is you can search for yourself, add yourself as a reviewer at the beginning, assign yourself a few submissions and review them. And then afterwards, go back and unassign yourself so that you don't use those reviews. But it would give you a way to test. And you can do it on real submissions. Just make sure you remove, you unassign yourself from the review. That will eliminate those reviews. They will go away, but it gives you a way to test that process and make sure you understand it. So that's the first thing you could do to test. Add yourself as a reviewer. The second thing you can do to test, uh, now obviously sending out the emails and all of that, those send out real emails. So I guess you could send an email to yourself when you've assigned yourself so you can see what the email looks like. So if you do what I had just suggested, you could go all the way through the process, send the bulk email to yourself, uh, reminding you, telling your, telling yourself to review. You could go through that process as well. Uh, and you could even go through the process of accepting and rejecting the proposal. Now, one thing I'll note 
is that I accepted these papers. If I want to go back to my completed reviews report and I wanted to look at the individual submissions again, I could, I could, and you'll notice these say accept and they don't let me reject it. There is a reason for that. And that is because I've already placed these papers into a session. And once I've done that, it takes away my options. If I go back into that session and remove the papers from it, or if I go back to the session that I created, which I essentially did what you're asking, I created a fake session. I could go back to that session and you'll notice I can't delete other people's sessions, but I have a link to, to delete my created session. If I delete the session I created and say yes, what's going to happen is those papers that said accepted in session, they get popped right back out and now I can place them in a different session. So I could create a fake session, add papers to it, delete the session, and everything is back where it was. And then if I needed to go back with, if I did have a fake submission, I could go into here once again, and since they're no longer in sessions, I could choose to reject them if I wanted an update. So you can practice with accepting and rejecting. The thing to know about accepting and rejecting is no email goes out automatically when you accept or reject someone. Nothing. Nothing goes out to them. They are not informed. They do not know. That does not happen until you get through the process. You've done your acceptance and rejections and added them to sessions. It'll likely you're sending out all of those notifications after your meeting or perhaps even during the meeting, but you're not until you've made those final decisions. So you can provisionally accept and reject anything and go back and change your mind. So you actually do have the ability to go back. You could go through and do a little testing. Just make sure you eliminate any fake data that you put in, like a fake session or a fake review by removing that review or unassigning that reviewer. Make sure you remove that before you move forward so that the submitters don't see whatever you put in there that was fake. Yeah, that thanks, Rick. I I think one of the things that um, I think is really helpful is that so many people are returning reviewers or, or area chairs and so um the returning area chairs can definitely support and help anyone that's new um yes. but they won't um they won't a number of people are saying they don't necessarily feel they need test papers but they know if they need to go through and see what the review process is like i think that's a, a useful thing Good. um that they can do um there's a couple of questions there's some reminders that I want to make sure to tell everyone, um, but there's a couple of questions about, um, or someone wants to hear just how people divide up tasks among themselves. And, oh, good question. Uh, let's see. When people are accepted into more than three as a paper. Yeah, so that's, uh, Melissa, thanks for that question, because Betsy asked the same thing. I believe the policy is, and I just need to clarify the language, that you cannot appear on the program more than three times. And I believe that includes being a chair or a discussant. That's always been my understanding. So, um, but we'll verify that. And there also was a question earlier about um, the limits, how many you will accept. So I have to go in um, and make decisions about how many um, sessions and papers you can accept for each area and you'll have that well in advance and also just know I to the point about the emails I need to go in and edit language um, about the emails there was also a question I think Lenny you typed a question about are your area chair excuse me reviewers from last year already in the system and Jesse yeah. had asked that question earlier on the answer is no because each year we create a new all academic system so if you had reviewers in your area from 2017 that you'd like to be reviewers for your area this year, you need to follow up with those individuals and ask them to volunteer to be reviewers this year. Everyone needs to sign up for um, All Academic 2018. This is a new system. And the other thing that I was thinking about, um, and Betsy, you and I can talk about this, or Caitlin, you and I as well, um, you know, I'm just looking at the volunteers that we currently have. I'd like to see a lot more, um, um, more senior uh, members 
volunteering as well. So we now have a new relationship with the Reading Hall of Fame, for example. It'd be great if we sent out an email to all of them and asked them all to sign up to be reviewers. So there's some things that we can still do to get people to sign up. But if you had people last year that were reviewers for your areas, you're going to need to follow up with them. Um, is there a bulk email that can be set? Uh, we, can, we can create one if you'd like uh, for a bulk email that you all can send, but you'd want to send it to your particular area if you have specific people. So I don't know if that answers the bulk, the question. The bulk doesn't email matter. doesn't work particularly well for trying to find no, right. last year. Because yeah. we don't have that data in here. It's and not in there, right. right. There are a lot of reasons. A lot of pe people change affiliations, change their email addresses, change all kinds of things. And by having them go through again, you know you have a fresh list and you aren't assigning reviews to people who are never going to answer an email because it's the wrong one. They right. had to come in this year. And so yeah. that's part of the reason it's useful to do that. Yeah, so what we could do, we could, I mean, and we have been, we can send out another email from LRA management overall to everyone, every member just saying, please sign up to be a reviewer. You know, we can do that. Um, we can use social media to remind people to sign up to be a reviewer, to volunteer to be a chair or uh, discuss it. Um, like I said, there's certain communities of people like the Reading Hall of Fame, or if you have specific folks that you know, you might want to just send out those personal. So that would be a task within your area that you all could divide up to do. But it is important that people log in and create a new login for 2018 to be a part of this review process. Are there other questions? I see people in the chat talking about how you divide up things. So well, let me um, talk about that real Mark. quick. Okay. Oh. If someone had a question. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was going to just interject on a question I saw earlier in the feed, but go ahead and handle this one first. Okay. One, there are a couple of, of things to note about this. I've, I've already deleted these, uh, these papers, uh, so they're not going to show up. But there are several stages where it's important to make sure that you're coordinating with your co-chair. Uh, one of them is when you're accepting and rejecting proposals. Make sure only one person is on that page doing that at a time. So presumably, if you're all in a meeting doing this, this is not a big deal. It's not. Because you just, you just load these and just have one person click. The other person should not save anything. Because when you do so, uh, the person who clicks last will overwrite the person who went first. Uh, similarly, when you're assigning reviewers, you might want to divide up what you're assigning. I, I say that because what you don't want to have happen is have one person uh, assigning three submit reviewers and another person assigning three reviewers at the same time, you could potentially end up with six, or depending on when you click and how you do it, it could, all, it could cause other issues. You may choose the same people, and it may cause some weirdness with the data. These pages are strict, they're just basic HTML is what gets displayed from the software. And so it doesn't know about someone else working on the same data at the same time. So just be cautious that you're not working on the exact same data at the same time. You can be in the software at the same time, but any big job, adding uh, papers to sessions, don't do that at the same time. Make sure you just split up the work. As long as you're working on different data, go at it. Uh, but if you're working on the same data, coordinate your work so you don't cause weird things to happen in the software. In, in addition to that, some people have a habit of opening multiple browser windows. Uh, that's not going to work for you very well. In fact, it's probably going to mess things up. So make sure you're in just one instance of this software when you're working in it so that you don't, there's the same problem you have with two people being in the system. You can end up doing some weird things to your data. And just don't do that and that will solve some problems. Okay, go ahead. There's a um, I was just going to go back to Melissa's question earlier. Um, she mentioned that last year the presenters did have access to the session organizer somehow, and um, some individuals contacted Melissa thinking she was a discussant, and she's not sure how that um, how they saw that she was a session organizer. Can you speak to that, Rick? If that makes sense. Well, let me just take a look. 
it's just a quick setting. I just have to make the, so the role is hidden and it's one checkbox. So, and it could be that it wasn't that way before. Yeah, it's set is not visible. So no, it's not going to show up in the software. Thank you. That's great. There was just a question. Noah asked, is there a browser that works best with all academic? Uh, we tend to use Firefox and Chrome a lot. And so they both work well. I use Safari a fair amount. I just don't find it as, uh, I, it's not, I'm not as efficient in it because it doesn't have all of my bookmarks and everything else, but uh, it works fine too. Uh, really, it, we test with pretty much every browser. The only thing that I'll say is uh, use a browser that's up to date. So for example, if you're using Internet Explorer, uh, don't do that anymore. Uh, the, uh, Microsoft doesn't even support Internet Explorer. Now, Microsoft Edge should work if you're using the most recent version, but make sure you're using something that's up to date and then you should be fine. Um, there was a question about um, just rejecting proposals before and not sending it out to reviewers if there was ever a policy. Um, I don't know that we've ever had a policy about it, but I do agree, and I remember this from last year, that sometimes there are proposals that do not follow any of the criteria that you know off the top, they just shouldn't be sent out. Um, yeah. and. So I see Melissa commenting too. If you have a question about that, um, please reach out to me and, and I can help make any you know, final decisions about that. But I think that we don't want to waste, reviewers time is really important. So we don't want to waste people's time. Um, the other thing, Lenny, to your question, how can we move a proposal over to a different area if it's not a good fit? This year, what's really different is that planning meeting. Because we will be together that planning meeting June 7th through the 9th, we'll be able to do a lot of that kind of work to make sure we have a more coherent program. And also, in terms of making final decisions, there will only be one person there. You will have communicated with your other co-area chairs, but you'll be making those decisions as a group together. We'll be making those decisions. So I think this year will be slightly different than some of the issues you may have had in the past. And again, we're piloting it this year to see how that works. but. Um, that's part of the, the rationale for why we're having a program planning meeting. Uh, what about if it has not been reviewed yet? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. Oh, if the, if the proposal hadn't been reviewed yet, then we should talk about um, a process for that. I think, though, if it's reviewed, it, I would still have it go through the review process. Have it still go through the review process. Um, and then if for some reason, at least last year, that's what I remember, that there were, if it's completely in the wrong area. Well, they could contact you and you theoretically yeah, and I can could switch transfer it. Over. Yeah. You could transfer it if it, I mean, that doesn't happen very often. I, say, I don't remember it happening last year. I do remember some other things. So, Lenny, I hope that answers your question. Just contact me if you feel you have one and then, you know, I could transfer it over. Um, how are authors notified of an accept or reject? Does the letter go out? When, so I have to put in bulk. Um, yeah, we send those notifications out and th there will be an email that will be drafted, but all of that will go out at the same time after our planning meeting. And that's done centrally, correct? Yes. You, you do that out of your office. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so that it's not, it's not done from a particular area. We do it all together. Yeah. Yeah. That way you know the dust is settled and everything is done. And it also, that's work that Caitlin's team and I, that we have to do because we also have to fit things into a program, into room, look, I mean, all of that has to be done. So when you all make your decisions, presumably after that June meeting, your work will be done, you know, your area, and then it's on us. Um, the question was, there was a question about, so one person from each area should be represented at the June meeting, and you'll receive an email from me shortly um, asking to verify who's coming. I know some people have already said, but now is the time for us to really determine who's coming because we want to begin to work on travel. We already have a hotel block and all of that, so um, that will all happen very soon, but it's one area chair per area. The meeting is in Syracuse, New York. 
So, and it's warm during that time of year. So you don't have to worry about snow. Um, yes. And then I'm so we should not submit. Yes. So there's a question. No, it's not a silly question because this happens. You all can still um, obviously submit um, proposals, but for the time that you're area chair, you will be discouraged from submitting anything to your own area. So. All right. Are there other questions? I think this was the really, I hope this was useful and productive for folks. And I'm, I'm really excited um, that um, we're, we recorded this so we could come back to it if people, you know, folks who weren't on. But there were like 40 participants on this Zoom. So I think almost everybody is there. Um, that may be a good use for other area. What would be a good use for other area? I think there was a, I think I'm understanding if it didn't fit. I'm, I, maybe I'm not understanding what that question was. Is that a good use of other area? Someone want to say what was meant? Oh, if you can't submit to your own area, it doesn't necessarily have to be other though. Couldn't it just be a different area? No. Yeah, I would say, again, I just think, okay. If it, right, if it doesn't fit other, yes, it would be the other. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm reading and talking at the same time. Um, I, I would say just for, I think it's easier um, to not submit to your own area, to not be on a, on a proposal for your own area. I mean, that's why for me this year as the program chair, I'm, I am not on any sessions because I have to review um, all of the program. So, you know, I just think for conflict of interest, um, but I would take yourself off, yeah, to Melissa's point. If for this year or, you know, it just is cleaner that way. Um, if you're working with colleagues, especially. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing because you don't want to not participate in the program, but you just have to make sure. And I, you know what, let me verify from other program chairs to see if they had, how they handled it. Cause I remember last year, I feel like maybe it was a situation because we have co-chairs that you just had other people in your area review. Um, but again, that you just gotta be really careful about, about that. So um, I think the safest thing is just to avoid proposing to your own area. But um, let me just verify with other people if we had situations and how we handled it in the past. So thank you, Rick, for um, your time. Yep, Melissa's point. Thank you, Rick, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for your time and being on. And you'll get a follow-up email from all of us, um, from Caitlin, with the recording to this that you can refer back to it along with the area chairs manual that you can refer back to. And I'll be sending out information shortly about the June planning meeting. March 1st is tomorrow. So tell folks to get those reviews in and let's work on getting reviewers. That's the next. Oh, and March 7th, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, there is a webinar uh, on, um, there's a webinar on being a reviewer. So please encourage your reviewers, and we'll send out something, but we want as many reviewers as possible to be on that webinar that can. So, um, I, uh, Ashley, I'll figure that out. Your question about how long. I'm, gonna, I'm also going to save this uh, chat. I know there's a way to save it. Yep, send file. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Chat.